Hey, thanks for tuning in again. Great to see you back. Um, as you can see, we survived the typhoon. Everything's been put back on the boat again. Um, the typhoon went slightly further north, which is um, in, which is good for us. You can't take any chances. You do have to prep as if it's going to be the worst it's going to be. For a lot of people down in Florida, that must have been quite a horrendous um, and terrifying storm to go through. It does make me feel very grateful that we didn't have that sort of um, those sort of conditions down here. You've left a few comments over the um, over the last couple of episodes. I'll attempt to answer them here as best as I can. Now I'm sorry for some of the length of these answers because um, I would have loved to give short, succinct sort of answers to these questions. Answers are based on my um, personal experiences and my observations. Um, you might get better mileage or have a different results from me anyway. First question from Rodney, who's asking about costs in Japan. You know, costs for um, things like supplies or food or just uh, repairs, that type of thing. So, costs in Japan, um, I suppose overseas, and certainly I did uh, before I arrived here, that everything in Japan was really expensive. And um, that's, I mean, certainly things are expensive here in some areas, but generally speaking, it's actually a fairly reasonable place to live as long as you're not living in the middle of a big city. It's pretty reasonable here. And the same goes for cruising. If you want to um, put yourself in a marina in the middle of Tokyo or Osaka, yep, it's going to be expensive. But if you don't want to do that and you just want to cruise the coastline, uh, see the sights, uh, you don't mind anchoring out or going up a wall, going up against a wall in a fishing port, then it's actually very, very reasonable. Um, you know, if you're anchoring out, it's free. The walls in most ports tend to be, uh, they will charge on, if they charge, will be on a per tonnage rate, which is generally speaking one yen per ton. Uh, TR is 13 tons, so that's 13 yen or 10 cents a day. If you are going into marinas, then yeah, prices are pretty comparable to European or, or American prices. You're looking at a dollar to a dollar fifty per foot for, for most sort of run of the mill marinas, and you do get services there, although they'll vary. Yeah, you get power and water on the dock most of the time, and they might have showers, that type of thing, and services for professionals if they want to, if you need to do any repairs. Repairs, you're going to, um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. If you need repairs to most electronics, um, your refrigeration, air con, and your rigging, you're gonna be struggling a bit. When it comes to electronics, um, pretty much forget about it. You're just gonna be buying new stuff and putting them in. Um, uh, same with air con uh, or refrigeration. If it's a simple matter of regassing, yep, you can get that done. Um, if it's anything other than that, you can forget about it. It's now your air con is just going to wait till you get to somewhere else to get a repair. And if your fridge or freezer is gone, just that's just going to be a, um, a storage unit until you can get offshore and get that um, to another place, uh, get to a proper service agent who can deal with it. In Japan, for food, are really good. Uh, come from New Zealand, which is fairly expensive. So as long as you're going to buy local, you're not buying imported brand foods and you're buying in season food, then it's really reasonable. And a good example would be, so for 80 US dollars a week, you can live quite well. For 100 US dollars a week, you're living really well. And for 150 dollars US a week, you're living really, really well. That's sort of protein and fancy foods and desserts every night just want a good anti-foul then I'll use a Japanese brand because they know their waters around here and they've been specifically chemistried for the conditions around here so yeah that's how I'll approach the anti-foul situation. Hauling out is um, it's a mixed bag if you want to haul out just to do a, a bottom uh, paint and uh, you know, clean your bottom, swap the anodes, you could probably do that on a sling over here. Um, most places in Japan you're not going to be able to um, haul out and put yourself on the hard for a couple of weeks or a month while you work on your boat. Well, I must say you can but you'd have to buy your own cradle, get it made to suit your boat and then that's your cradle forever. <laughs> it's yours. 
Um, so that, that's quite expensive. Um, so it's probably not the best way of doing that. But if you are here and you are going to be here for a long haul and you do want to work on your boat, then yeah, maybe that's an option for you. Chandri here, Yukon Marine, which is started by a Canadian sailor who came here. He, they are quite good. They do have a, quite a range of, of things available. The prices are fairly reasonable considering that they have to import them. You could buy the same things overseas and import them, but by the time they, you buy that, you, you buy the goods, you pay for the freight and you pay for the 10% income. Um, tax that comes on top of it, 8 to 10 percent, then the price is not that much difference. And with Yuko, and anywhere in Japan, if you buy something in Japan, you'll get it in a couple of days. It, it's quite reasonable for that. All right, okay, next question. Next question is from Mick. Hi, Mick, great to see you commenting. I always like to talk to you. Uh, by the way, my offer stands. I think I made that offer to you a few years ago. If you can get yourself over here, you're welcome to come cruising with me. Um, Next year, this year, you'd, all, all I get you to do is do a lot of work, so more haul outs, anti foul, a lot, lot of painting, not much fun. So, yeah, wait till next year and we can go for sale. So, Mick says it must have been kind of frustrating to uh, have all that slat rigging last uh, from the last video. Yes, it was frustrating, it's always frustrating when this sort of stuff happens because it's my fault. Um, um, my fault that I didn't check it beforehand, it was fairly obvious, it's my fault I didn't notice I didn't, I had the wrong sail up, that was fairly obvious but I didn't click in my mind. The most annoying thing about it, the frustrating thing about it was I actually had the sail in the cockpit. It was sitting here in a bag, it's brand new and I just overlooked the whole thing um, and I felt kind of a bit, kind of uh, frustrated or disappointed for the, the, the guests I had on board who should have had a, a much better sail. <laughs> than I gave them. However, yeah, we all have fun, a bit of a laugh, and it was fine. Righto, the last comment this week is from a guy called Sullivan One, who basically says, due to creep and um, being slack, he doesn't use Dyneema anymore, he uses, he's, he's stuck with stainless steel. Um, yeah, and no, um, there's a lot of uh, misinformation about Dyneema out there. Um, I was extremely fortunate that I had Peter Grieg available, just around on board and just available for when I was doing it, uh, making my rigging. He is an incredibly um, experienced synthetic rigging expert, I think I could say. Um, and he showed me and told me and said do this and do that um, to get my rigging correct done the right way to his standard. It might not look to his standard, but it, it, it should be done to his standard. Um, and the three things to bear in mind are you have to use the right Dyneema. You can't just use Dyneema, it has to be a certain specification, it's, it's heat set to the right everything, uh, right chemical composition and all that sort of stuff. So important one, get the right Dyneema for your standing rigging. As far as I understand, there's only one type of Dyneema for your rigging, for your standing rigging, and that's the one you have to use. Two, get the right diameter of Dyneema. There is a scale um, where Dyneema starts to creep, which is at the top end of its uh, tension, way at the top there. Uh, it will creep, but if you get the right size um, rigging, you won't, you shouldn't ever come to that sort of uh, end of the uh, stress graph, I guess it is. You shouldn't be up there, you should stay down here and the right star size rigging will help with that. And the third one is making a splice and this is really critical because I see a lot of people online putting their splice into together and I'm thinking, mm, it's not what Peter would <laughs> recommend and I, after I'm doing, doing it myself, I can certainly see why. So the key to this is tension, you need at least for my rigging, I think he said a ton, it's a while ago, he said it might have been more than that, but I think a ton of tension on your, oh, that's a literal ton, not a figurative ton. I put a ton of tension on it, it just wasn't the correct type of ton. Um, you put a tension of ton on your rigging, so when you've created your splice, then you lay it out on a nice clean area that has no sand, no grip, no nothing on there because all those things can bet into the fibers and break them. They're not very good at all, or crush them. 
Um, so you lie it all out and then you put a whole lot of tension on your splice, a ton of tension on your splice. And then when you've got a light, you put a piece of wood down and then you get it back into the hammer and you just tap that splice that you've created. And what happens is with that tension and the tapping, it will, it sort of settles that splice, it all settles in and you can see it happening in front of your eyes. And so what you do is then you go and retension that and you tap, 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 you retension and you retension. So that tight, that splice is as tight as it can be. It's not going to move after that. Now I couldn't do that because two things. One, I didn't have any money. We were totally skint to even go and buy anything that I could use to tension it up. All I did have was my six, uh, my six to one purchase, my block and tackle. I had two of those. So I put those on and tightened as much as I could. Um, but I know it wasn't anywhere near uh, tight enough. And I know that because uh, the Dyneema, the, she no, the sheathing I've got for my Dyneema, my cover, um, should have slipped over, should have slipped over that splice nice and easily. And the guys I bought them from down in Hamper Jam, down in New Nelson, New Zealand, I said, "You sure it fits over?" And they said, "Yep, we've tested it. It fits. It slides on, no problems whatsoever." And of course, when I was doing it, it wouldn't slide on. I was cursing these guys unfairly, of course. I was cursing these guys that this doesn't bloody fit on, and I thought I had it as tight as I could. Um, I did manage to get it on, but it was so, so tight to get on. Now, after a couple of years of the mask going back and forth and doing a bit of sailing, uh, my splices have tightened up really well now, and I don't expect any more movement in them. And that sheath just now slips over, easy as can be, not a worry. So that's the third part to getting a really good um, set Dyneema standing rigging. So why is my standing rigging so slack? That's because of my double braid lashings. Um, I've got double braid. Again, I'm supposed to pre-stretch them before I put them in. Pre-stretching just means you take out all the initial stretch. So um, when you stretch it, yeah, you stretch a piece of, I've got some here actually. When you stretch it, it will stretch a little bit further and it will stay there. And you stretch it again and it will stay there. What you're doing with pre-stretching, you're getting, getting rid of all that additional stretch in there and you're left with just the, um, what's left in the stretch, just what's left in the stretch. So when you pull it, you can you, it will stretch, but it will, it will bounce back to where it was. It will stretch and then bounce back to where it was. So I'm getting rid of the stretch to the point where it stretches, but will bounce back. Whereas up to now, I'm stretching it and that stretch will stay there. So that's the reason why my rigging is now loose. So rigging is a trade, and like any trade, it is built up of years and years and decades of, uh, of knowledge and experience to give you the best result. And Peter Grieg was able to sort of basically distill all that uh, for me to get my job done as best as possible.